dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back from the place where we Everybody and welcome back to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson and I'm joined as always by the man with the angelic voice, the throat of the goat, Mr. Papa Smokes. Once again, Papa Smokes, how the hell are you doing? I'm doing great, Munson, and how are all my wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully everybody's doing great, being fantastic, loving some of this nice weather we've been having as of late. It's off to a great start in 2021. Hopefully things are going to start getting better. Everyone's going to get healthier and things will get back to normal sometime soon. Fingers crossed anyway. But in the meantime, Pop Smokes, we got some wrestling to cover here on Ring Respect today. We're covering MLW episodes 114 and 115, giving a full rundown and review of the two of them, which includes the semifinal, other semifinal match from the Opera Cup and the finals from the Opera Cup. So something very fun to look forward to right here on Ring Respect Radio. If you have not done so already, make sure to hit the subscribe button down below. Click the notification bell so you know anytime we have new content right here on Ring Respect Radio. So, Pop Smokes, I think we need to get right down to it. MLW 114, let's kick it off. I think this is the one that this started off with a little bit of a showcase out in the parking lot showing uh, the arrival of Alexander Hammerstone and Richard Holiday to the arena, about to have an interview where they are attacked by some masked men in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah, we have this little vignette, so to speak, and uh, I guess what they're doing is showing us that there's still some tension and some ongoing uh, dispute between uh, Dynasty and Contra, because uh, these masked men are, are probably or allegedly uh, representing Contra, trying to jump Hammer and Holiday in the parking lot, but uh, winding up getting smashed themselves. So they're setting the uh, setting the table for this episode and for this next pay per view, I suppose. So how about that uh, little bit of comedy that we got in here from Richard Holiday when uh, Alexander Hammerstone went to go slam the one guy's face right into the front hood of the car and Holiday, hold up, hold up, it's a rental. So he ends up giving him a back elbow instead. Yeah, that, that's good. I think they should play to uh, Holiday's strengths. One of them is that he's kind of a funny guy. He's a good talker and. This joke came along well. Uh, they also have a little program where uh, Alicia, too, is the announcer, is is kind of uh, suggesting that Richard Holiday is uh, phoning her lots and uh, interested in her in some way. And there was a little bit of ha ha made about that too. We'll see where we go with where they go with that in the future. Well, I believe she's Canadian, so I mean, you can't blame the guy for uh, going after a fellow Canadian anytime. Sure. But you moving on from there, we're kicking the night off, and uh, we've got a match to start off the night. We've got a, a MLW debut again, a new face, uh, Buku Dao, I believe is the way we pronounce it, going to be taken on L.A. Park Jr. So uh, some initial thoughts before we even get to the match. Initial thoughts when you saw Buku Dao entering that ring with TJP as his ring mentor. Yeah, I guess we saw him briefly in the previous episode when he seconded TJP out to the ring for his match. And uh, as we understand, he's the understudy. Uh, they're uh, comrades in wrestling and uh, Buku Dao uh, with a martial arts background, but has been uh, training professional wrestling style with TJP for some time. I don't know if this is his actual ring debut or uh, just MLW debut, but uh, we got a new guy. He's uh, he's definitely lot, not large in stature, if that's what you're getting at, Munson. But I think it looks. Pr- yeah, I was gonna say sorry to interrupt, but that's exactly where I was going with that one too. I mean, you look at him and it's like, wow, I I gotta see what he does in the ring because 
definitely doesn't come across intimidating to stature by any means. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, with this guy's uh, resume, however, it kind of counteracts that a little bit. This guy's got all kinds of uh, kickboxing and martial arts skill. He's got a, a, a nice physique on him for a, a small man, and uh, so you know he's functionable as a wrestler. So, uh, yeah, interested to see you, uh, what he's got in the ring against the much larger L.A. Park Jr. Yeah, L.A. Park Jr., quite a large guy. Large guy. Um much like his uh, father before him and stuff like that, and always being joined at ringside by uh, by his pops there as well, too. I thought, uh, despite it being a debut, I didn't really necessarily see this one going the way it did. I mean, especially with uh, the experience of L.A. Park Jr. and the size of him and everything, but Buku Dao getting a roll-up win, and, you know, whether uh, very surprising and utilized in probably a good way. This is probably one of those times where I could get behind this as long as it doesn't happen too often. This is one of those... Uh, new fresh face gets that upset roll up, uh, you know, maybe reminiscent of the day when Sean Waltman, one, two, three kid rolled up Razor Ramon unexpectedly back when he made his WWF debut. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And, and, and look where that went. I mean, they made a, a, a part of that to the X-Pac. So, uh, yeah, I was a little surprised by the ending of this match as well, but, um, like we said, he, he kind of looks pretty good despite being a small guy, but I, I think they probably have a plan for him. Uh, having him go over L.A. Park Jr. is a pretty decent win on TV, so uh, they've got a plan for him for uh, more of a middle division uh, program, I imagine. And uh, I, they have a couple of the uh, uh, smaller individuals in mind for him later on. Possibly could we see him up against uh, Leo Rush or a Myron Reed? We'll just have to see. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Court has a plan for uh, Buku Dao. He could even come up against the guy who cut the next promo on the show. We're talking Jordan Oliver cutting a promo here, talking about his grudge match coming up with Simon Gotch at Kings of Coliseum. Uh, thoughts on the the delivery of this promo from Jordan Oliver? Uh, <laughs> I can see where you're leading with this already, Mets. Uh, I, I've always kind of wanted to like Jordan Oliver. I, I think he has some work to do. Here's another guy that needs to get some more time in the weight room, get some uh, some steak and potatoes, and get gets a few pounds on there. Um, I think his promos are not not doing it for me. They're they're not intense. He kind of almost seems like joking around or assing around a little bit. I think there's potential with uh, Jordan Oliver, but uh, I, he's got work to do, I think. So what did you think of this? I, I'm in the same boat as you. Again, like I think I've said it many times about how like the uh, the character, the way he comes across really gets under my skin. But I think when I reflected on it a bit, it's very reminiscent of I, I had tons of guys that acted this way when I was in high school and stuff like that that thought they were the, uh, the cool shits with uh, – you know, the backwards hat and the pants halfway down their ass back in the day and stuff like that, uh, talking like they're very gangster despite growing up in the mean streets of Saskatchewan, Canada. You know, like, um, it doesn't come across intimidating enough yet. I think, like you said, a little bit more meat on the bones of Jordan Oliver and a little bit more oomph in that voice and stuff. Like, he still sounds very much like a kid to me yet to really come across as something that I need to take serious or intimidating. And again, like you said, comes across like you're not sure if he's clowning around like a class clown sort of thing. Uh, th there, there's most likely a lot of potential here with the kid. Obviously, he can he can carry himself talking in front of a camera, which is, you know, like not great, but still better than a lot of guys are currently capable of doing. So being that he's so young, you know, I think give him some time. We might see, a, might see some more better things from uh, Jordan Oliver in the years to come. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And, uh, if you look up some of Oliver's previous matches that aren't in MLW, you'll notice that he has a style that's completely different than his character on MLW. He's uh, very much a hundred miles an hour, a flippy reversal guy, dive to the outside sort of dude, which he doesn't do in MLW, which is kind of like refreshing to see that, that he's actually going to, uh, work a different style, uh, work the style that the promoter wants him to work. And uh, I, I think he'll uh, he'll only win out and learn more by uh, by working a different style than that, by not uh, doing everything 500 miles an hour and, uh, and uh, doing the current trendy, flippy style. I, I'm 
prefer him in the in the uh, uh, injustice faction where he can uh, do some heels heel stuff and uh, and just work a more pro wrestling style. And he's definitely going to get that work uh, given to him from Simon Gotch as well too. So this is actually in many ways, a really good match for someone, the level of Jordan Oliver, to work with someone with that experience and that type of ring style that can definitely ground his game and bring it to a level that he can learn a lot in that uh, in that one little match that he's got coming up here. Yeah, this match has actually caught my interest a little bit more now that I think. Definitely so. So uh, from there, speaking of catching our interest, it's the big man, the Black Hand of Contra, Mads Kruger, and he's taking on a two-man combination of Bud Heavy and Daniel Sterling. So now they're going with Mods Kruger crush mash, uh, squash matches, but against two opponents at the exact same time. What do you think of this one, Papa Smokes? Uh, I think it was a good match for TV. It was a, a good platform for Mads Kruger to look completely huge and completely dominant. I think it would have been a poor idea to put him in a competitive match at this time. Well, I suppose it was competitive. He was against two men, but however, they they didn't get uh, much offense, if any, in in this match because Mads is just an unstoppable monster at this point, and uh, he gave his uh, finisher to uh, one wrestler on top of the other wrestler, left them lying there in a in a crumpled heap, and then the uh, underlings came out with the body bags and put them in and it's it, it's a good spectacle I, I like it it's a squash match which is uh, only a minute or so or two minutes in in length but then they they made it longer by uh, by the sort of ritual afterwards of putting these wrestlers bodies in these body bags and kind of setting up the whole contra pose and everything uh, I like how they're doing it it makes it look good it makes Madge Kruger look extremely undefeatable going into Kings of Coliseum against Alexander Hammerstone. And wasn't it fantastic, uh, the work done by Rich Bokini and St. Laurent on commentary, talking about how backstage officials were uh, doing their best to try to hold back Alexander Hammerstone, who was trying to fight his way out to the ring to take on Mads Kruger, making Hammerstone look like an absolute badass because he's trying to come out there and face this monster in the ring right then and there. But at the same time, again, I think, to the smart, smartest of us, we know damn well Hammerstone wasn't even in the building at this point in time, but really selling the idea that he's back there, they're holding his ass back, letting sure that they're saving this one for Kings of Coliseum. And completely true, and I like the way that they uh, made reference to Hammer's backstage uh, uh, disturbance in other segments of the show too, which kind of led to its believability a bit. I mean, but the other guys who were trying to do promos were making like there was a disturbance going on in the back, which just made it all more believable. Uh, well done on their part, I think. Totally agree with you on that. Uh, so well done. Great job. Uh, makes me more interested for this match that I was already excited for. But uh, from there, we, uh, you know, we talked about this on the last episode of the show, Pop Smokes, Lena, uh, officially making sure that everyone knows she's bringing Neil Mortez to MLW. We're, Pretty excited about that as a big dude, big intimidating veteran of the ring that they're bringing in there. I mean, I almost feel like MLW is really stacking the card in their favor with some great talents that they can utilize going into 2021 here. Yeah, that's uh, part of uh, Court Bauer and MLW have that working relationship with AAA Lucha in Mexico City. And uh, and uh, there's another smaller promotion in Tijuana that they're working with. So, uh I mean, absolutely. Trade talent with the uh, with the Mexicans. Get some uh, some of their best guys. Do some shows down there and get a MLW fan following going to go. As uh, we understand that uh, Bauer is trying to do that in other parts of the world too. It just it lends an international feel to the show, which which lends uh, an aura of real sporting competition in it too. And it just shows the the wide world of wrestling, the colorful world of wrestling, but different characters that there are that we never get to see because they're in different countries or we don't get their TV shows. But here we're going to get to see Mil Muertes for a while on MLW TV and uh, someone that probably not a lot of modern fans are uh, experienced in watching. So uh, again, it just it's fun for the fan because you get different talent all the time. Definitely. So it's going to be very unique to see. So 
Uh, from there, we were expected to have the return of Alexander Hammerstone to in-ring competition since his beat down at the hands of the Black Hand of Contra, Mads Kruger. But as we were saying, they had sold the idea that this backstage fight was going on, that they were having to keep Alexander Hammerstone under control. And we were let known that Alexander Hammerstone had been removed from the building and that they would not be proceeding with a one-on-one -on -one competition to make sure that nothing further went down between Contra and Alexander Hammerstone. Great way to keep Hammerstone in that conversation again without having to put him right back in that ring. I mean, they've been saving that since that first night of the return. That was that one match that Hammerstone had. Since then, they've built this beautiful story, have not had to waste him in a bunch of matches leading up to it. And you couldn't be more excited for this main event opportunity coming down on Wednesday night. Yeah, very well done. Just the, the hype machine working, the overdrive, just to make sure that everybody knows that this is a huge match that, uh, as terrifying as Matt's crew, it's equally strong as Alexander Hammerstone and, and completely unafraid of Matt's crew dying to get his hands on. This is a really good promotional technique uh, right before the pay-per-view to keep, the, keep both wrestlers in the conversation, keep the fans minds on and keep the fans invested in this match. Um, one quick thing I wanted to bring up too before we get to the first match is that uh, this is the first I've seen on MLWs that they seem to have a partnership with Pro Wrestling Illustrated Magazine, which is uh, pretty cool, I think. And, and uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated is doing uh, top 10 rankings like they used to do in the magazine. So this tickles me especially because I'm a I was a kid before the internet was around and reading the, the uh, wrestling magazine, so I always was interested in the rankings. And uh, if you don't mind, Munson, I'll just read these out quickly. We'll see how Pro Wrestling Illustrated has ranked the wrestlers in in MLW. They had at number 10, Mads Kruger, the newcomer, not proven yet, so he's uh, in at number 10. Nine, another new guy, uh, Calvin Tankman. Number eight, Richard Holiday. Number seven, Laredo Kid. Number six, ACH. Number five, Mike Reed holding that middleweight championship, so he's in the middle of the pack there. Number four, L.A. Park. Number three, Filthy Tom Lawler. Number two, Low Key. Number one, Alexander Hammerstone. And then, of course, champion Jacob Fatu. So I, I, I find this uh, kind of gives me a kick uh, back to the old magazines and such, and uh it's nice that Pro Wrestling Illustrated is still somewhat relevant in the in the world of wrestling. Uh, their online uh, publication still gets a lot of reads, and of course, probably what they're best known for nowadays is the PWI Top 500, where they rank the top 500 wrestlers in the entire world. And uh, yeah, just I, I wanted to add that bit in there just to just to further uh, MLW's uh, integrity and uh, seriousness in in professional wrestling they got uh, pwi on their side so th up to that um yeah so pop smokes yeah the pwa uh top 10 they're very interesting um how how much do you agree with the top 10 because i think i'm i'm pretty on board with it although i might have reversed the positions of calvin tankman and mads kruger in those spots that they were given okay i i still think it's pretty good i mean having the the champion sit alone on the top. The number one is Hammerstone because he has the open weight championship belt. Uh, number five, Myron Reed because he holds uh, the you know the middleweight belt, so he's not he's not wrestling all the all the roster and all the heavyweights. I think it's pretty good. Um, low key at two, Lawler at three, L.A. Park. It's it's arbitrary, I suppose, and, and I mean it's hard to put together ratings at this point when they they haven't been active uh, for uh, a number of months until the past few weeks. But uh, I just like this partnership, Pro Wrestling Illustrated and MLW. Uh, yeah, it shows that uh, MLW is one of the legit feds out there that uh, a fine publication like Pro Wrestling Illustrated will uh, acknowledge and work with. Yeah, it's fantastic. I really enjoyed this too, and I was hoping you'd bring that up because uh, I figured that was right up your alley, Pop Smoke. So, uh, fantastic job there. Uh, but uh, moving on from there, we hit up our main event of the evening on MLW 114. This is the other semifinal match from the Opera Cup. We know that at this point, Low Key is in the final. We need to know who he's going to be going up against. And we got a matchup between ACH and Filthy Tom Lawler. Uh, 
bring us into this one, Pop Spokes, and give us your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, this is looking like a great semifinal match right here. ACH had taken some time off last year, and I think this was one one of his first or his first match back since the whole COVID shutdown thing. But um, we all know he's an awesome talent, uh, a great high flyer, a pretty strong guy, pretty excellent grappler, but he's in there tough against filthy Tom Lawler. Uh, we've talked before about his MMA experience in the – ultimate fighting championship and uh this guy's got the cauliflower ears and the, he's a striker he's a wrestler he's a brawler and a, a wild character in this so i mean this is going to be a tough one to pick lawler versus ach but the winner goes on to the final to meet low-key in the 2020 opera cup yeah and this i mean what what are your thoughts of the match itself because i mean quite frankly pop suppose i watched this one i this came across as one of my favorites from the entire tournament in the end. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I like the way MLW does this with, uh, with talent that can handle it anyway, such as Lawler and ACH that the first five, six minutes of the match was, was serious grappling. Like it was, uh, not looking like the pro wrestling style, but looking like grappling on the mat, like uh, jujitsu or, uh, or, uh, Olympic freestyle wrestling. And I like that because it lets the it lets the grapplers uh, go back to their skill set, go back to their sporting backgrounds and such, and have a little match with each other. And it, again, there has to be doesn't have to be a winner or a loser in this in this first few minutes, but it's setting the stage for what's to come. And I simply love that when a pro wrestling match starts. With yeah, and which are Olympics about. Um, so, yeah, as you're saying there, Papa Smokes, in that uh, first uh, several minutes, uh, that absolute grappling on the mat, I absolutely enjoyed watching that. I thought it was fantastic. It's great to see, especially when you got two guys very capable of putting it on and making it interesting and not, uh, you know, making it an absolute snooze fest and stuff like that, like some people seem to think that style is. Uh, from there, I mean, it went into some great wrestling action and ended up being a, a phenomenal match, in my opinion. Now, uh, Definitely, like I said, probably one of my favorites from the cup itself. Um, yeah, and Filthy Tom Waller picking up the win. I kind of had a thought this was the way it was going to go once I found out that uh, Low Key was in the final. I kind of figured this was heading for Low Key Filthy Tom Waller. It did not take away from the match at all for me. Even despite that, I still felt strongly that this was a great match of interest to me, and I enjoyed it from start to finish. Yeah, I also thought that man and uh, Filthy Tom to, continues to impress me of how he's transitioned from MMA fighting to uh, pro wrestling style. He's really done it quite nicely. His, his timing and his psychology is good. Uh, he was playing the heel in this match, or uh, as he is currently in the MLW, and uh, he got some tremendous heat on uh, ACH throughout this match, and the ACH had to uh, struggle and claw to make a huge comeback and, of course, just when it seemed like ACH was on the verge of victory, a Lawler advances by pinfall. And, uh, yeah, uh, an awesome match. Kept you going up and down. Didn't know who was going to win. Uh, had a feeling like you did, but uh, they, they put it on a one the show. Yeah, it was fantastic. Great job by MLW. Uh, making this Opera Cup definitely investable and worthwhile to take the time to you know watch and now we've got you know a great finish to it we're going to get low key versus filthy tom lawler which we're going to talk about uh, right away as we transition to the next episode here but any last thoughts as we uh finish up with mlw 114 papa smokes no uh it's really just a solid show introducing some new talent putting over some uh uh big talent for the pay-per-view and then an exciting match in the uh, opera cup uh tournament which is just on tv which won't have anything to do with the uh pay-per-view so yeah a little bit of everything for uh for everybody so uh this one sets up the pay-per-view sets up the final for the opera cup and uh we're headed to mlw fusion number one yeah number 115 it is so this is going to have the finals of the opera cup featured on it uh, but to start things off, we get a video package, which kind of explains the history of the Opera Cup, naming some of the uh, former 
winners, you know, for example, Hackenschmidt and Stu Hart, who was the final winner of the Opera Cup, and just kind of giving everybody a little bit of that history so you know what you're in for and what the prestige behind this trophy is and the two guys that are going to be going after it in low-key and filthy Tom Lawler at the top of the night. Great match, especially for a free match on YouTube. Uh, great build to this one, don't you agree? Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. It's a... Uh, uh, one of the facts that I liked about the opera and cop the actual statue itself is that they were uh, saying that MLW took this this trophy itself to uh, the same uh, company that uh, maintains the Stanley Cup trophy for hockey. Yes, and yeah. That's <laughs> who restored it and shined it up all real nice. So uh, just another little fun fact about the opera cup uh, for our listeners. And doesn't that also give it a more of a sporting feel at the same time? Like this is being treated as a, you know, on the level of something like a Stanley Cup. So, I mean, they show it the kind of respect it deserves. And therefore, when you treat it with that kind of respect, fans will accept it as that kind of respect kind of thing. I think in some ways almost becomes more respectful than half of the wrestling championships that are out there these days. Because those things are passed around like, you know, a pair of dirty underwear nowadays. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Once your company starts taking a famous, and you put a you put a turntable on it and all, it starts to lose the shine completely. And uh, I just like that they stored this fact from wrestling's long past that get new in in the in twenty and and make it a uh, title to win or a trophy and. They, they have all the wrestlers come out, look at it, have a nice look at it. They all want it real bad, everybody that's in that tournament. So uh, I, I love the way they've done it and built up the Opera Cup. Yeah, it's been done really fantastically. Uh, but uh, let's uh, let's kick into the actual show itself. That's just the recap heading into what we're about to see. But we're getting the matchup. We were talking about these guys in our predictions video to the Kings of Coliseum, the Dirty Blondes. Uh, taking on the team of Ariel Dominguez and Daniel uh, Starling, I believe the names were. Uh, this was an opportunity to get to see the Dirty Blondes before they get that tag title match against the Von Erics. Uh, what are your initial thoughts with the Dirty Blondes here? Yeah, yeah, com- uh, completely new to me as a tag team. Uh, I hadn't seen them before, uh, MLW. Looking good, uh, kind of a throwback team to the 80s. They look like an old uh, Southern uh, Texas NWA team. A couple of kind of redneck fellas, big boys, uh, cowboy hats, uh, bull rope with a big cowbell on the end and looking rough and tough out there with a lady manager. And uh, yeah, this is obviously going to be the next tag team in their roster and they're probably going to push them up to the point where, as we see now, that they've got a tag team title match against the Von Eric. But... Yeah, it's uh, going to be an interesting one. I definitely enjoyed watching this. Uh, the Dirty Blondes picking up a victory and getting to showcase themselves in the tag division was fantastic to see. Um, from there, Paul Bismos, we had a uh, Hammer, uh, Alexander Hammerstone promo, uh, again, leading into his whole thing with uh, Mads Kruger and, uh, you know, also mentioning that he's uh, after Jacob Fatu for the title there. Uh, again, we've, we've talked about this over and over again this this whole episode of mlw was really promo heavy i found because the end of this is going to be all focused on that opera cup match so really i mean as far as i know unless my notes are different from yours i think we had that hammerstone promo and then a low-key promo prior to the actual match itself if i'm not mistaken well yeah i think there were even a few more little packages in there too because uh this would be the last episode before Kings of Coliseum pay-per-view. And uh, so they needed extra time to promote that. And uh, also probably some extra time for the Opera Cup final match. You, you know that one's getting 20 or 25 minutes probably at least. So, yeah, there's only going to be two matches in this episode. But that's fine because we've got all our uh, promos updating the uh, feuds going into pay-per-view on 6th and uh yeah this is quite often how it's done that give some of your talent that last week off let them get ready for the pay-per-view and use promo packages to uh to reel the fans in it to make the uh the purchase for the pay-per-view oh exactly and uh, yeah i mean it's 
it's pay-per-view usually, but this is not uh, one that fans need to purchase. So if you haven't already seen it, because yeah. this will be out afterwards, uh, you can check out Kings of Coliseum right on YouTube. So thank you to MLW for putting out a quality show like that absolutely free where, you know, they could have very well been asking for people to be paying up for this one. Yeah, no, I completely forgot when I was saying that too. And you uh, call it a pay-per-view, but it's actually just a feature show. And uh, MLW uh, hands in many pots uh, with uh, sponsorships and such like that. They're going to give this show uh, to the fans and for free. And man, this is really a quite a good promotional technique, I think. And uh, I think they're going to get a lot of eyes on their product. Definitely, they will. And. Uh... So all those promos were leading up to what we're about to get into here, Pop Smokes. We had Loki doing his promo cutting beforehand, and then we're right down to it. It is the finals of the Opera Cup. It is Loki taking on Filthy Tom Lawler. And it, if I was a betting man before this thing kicked off, my money was on Loki winning this thing. I thought the older veteran wrestler, the way this has been built, the way it's been presented. I just really had a feeling that this was to put Loki's name amongst all those names that have been on the Opera Cup. Now, uh, why don't you lead us into this a little bit, and then we'll start talking about the finish to this one and talk about the match itself as well, too. Sure, sure. I, I felt the same as you going into this match. I kind of was giving the edge in the back of my mind to Loki also because, uh, like you said, veteran and uh, well, well respected around MLW, but also... If you remember the 2019 Opera Cup, he's one of the one of the returnees from that, and they, and they're uh, they mostly have a different uh, little lineup this year. But Loki was featured heavily in last year's too, even though he didn't make it to the final. He worked really hard in that uh, tournament and uh, did a lot of selling and a lot of punishment to his body, etc. And had a few competitive and very long matches in that. I kind of had it in my mind that if he was in it again this year, that it might go his way too. So that's kind of how I was thinking when I came into this too. But if you look at this match on paper, it's it's very, very hard to call. We've got a couple of uh, martial artists who are now professional wrestlers who can obviously shoot if they want to. Uh, they, between the two of them, they have to know how many holds and how many transitions and such. They're going to be able to work each, uh, work a great match with each other. So, yeah, I kind of had the feeling that maybe Loki was going to come through with this one. Uh, what did you think of the match itself? There was, there was a lot of good sports-based grappling in this to it. It looked like it could be a UFC fight for the first six, seven minutes. Uh, if, if not longer, even. I think I even uh, spoke out on social media saying that this was hands down probably my favorite uh one-on-one, -on -one, you know, basically mat wrestling encounter of all of 2020. Um, in terms of being an actual physical wrestling match and looking like a sporting competition and stuff, I don't think you could get closer to a sporting fight of any kind in all of 2020 than what this match delivered. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, Munson. Uh, this looked completely... Uh, uh, completely real and could like a true contest between two guys that are struggling against each other. And I, I, I think that's the beauty of having guys like this on your roster. They can do little shoots like that little, uh, few minutes of let's just grapple for a bit. Let's see who's tougher. If I put, if I can get you down, that's fine. But if you get me down, that's fine too. We're going to come up and do our spots later. But, uh, this just looked like awesome grappling of, uh, two guys more or less the same size and uh, just having an all out great grappling match with it, which then turned into a greasier match with some uh, rules being uh, broken and some uh, outside uh, distractions and, and such. But uh, one of my favorite spots in this month was, did you see the part where uh, Lawler put low key in the figure four leg lock and then low key was sitting up trying to escape, trying to, uh, punch Lawler in the face and Lawler then put his arms in a key lock. Yeah. He's got the two submission holds on at the same time, one on the legs, one on the arms. Nice, very nice touch. And, it, you know, something like that takes a true technician to know not only how to put that on, but to pull it off in that exact moment and make it look as good as it did. It was phenomenal. I loved it. I thought it was a great timing, great job by Filthy Tom Lawler. Uh, yes, one of the best spots other than, and I got to say, I loved the finish of this matchup. 
yeah, yeah. It, it was a well booked finish, I think. Uh, it got low key out of there without making him look weak. Uh, but uh, uh, Lawler getting the uh, pin on him, uh, kind of a kind of a rolled up position, and then sticking his feet on the ropes. It, it, I like the way that spot went too because it wasn't perfect. Like it didn't look choreographed at all because Lawler really didn't get his feet on the ropes hardly at all because they were scrambling to get that spot. It looked convincing. It looked real. It, it looked like a guy getting pinned for real. And of course, that's exactly what we wanted pro wrestling. Yeah. And anybody who hasn't seen it, actually uh, Lawler in the corner there and uh, low key coming in with that. Uh, what, what would you call that move? Uh, Papa smokes. I've been not too up on the, like I'm, that's a, kind of a flip kick of sorts into the corner that he gives yeah, to yeah. And then, uh, yeah, literally, I all of a sudden, Lawler just kind of fell with his weight on a mostly deflated low key and managed to pick up that three count. Looked like he was going to try to put his feet on the ropes, but I don't. I think he almost sold that he didn't quite even have the energy to cheat at that point, and that the pinfall happened because both men were completely beat and deflated at this point. Yeah, yeah, and that kick he had received like was basically knocking him over, but he fell on top in the. Uh advantageous position and uh that three count comes pretty quick after a long match like that and uh here we got a new opera cup 2020 winner filthy tom lawler nicely done too and man he's been killing it as of late looking good and uh you know i can see filthy tom heading right back into that title picture as we move forward in mlw i think he's got every bit uh every bit of the uh what they need in a champion and stuff. I like what he's doing with his new faction and stuff. Team Filthy with Violence is Forever. Uh, now he's got the Cop- Opera Cup win behind him. Uh, just all the momentum in 2021. And I'm really enjoying the promos that he's been cutting as well lately too. I think he's really starting to come along nicely and is going to start to become a much bigger name too. Yeah, I think so too. My, again, with that, my only worry is that hope MLW can hold on to him because uh if I owned another Fed, I would be uh, looking to get this guy. He adds legitimacy and uh, and just some good old fun to your uh, roster too. He's a he's a completely legitimate in the ring, and yet he's kind of a kind of a wacky and funny guy uh, uh, outside the ring and in his promos and stuff. I, I think he's gold, and he's gotten so good, and I think he's only going to get better. He's a wacky and funny. Uh, former MMA fighter. Oh, see, he kind of reminds me of somebody we know from around here named yeah. Mitch Danger Zone Clark, eh? Yeah, just a little bit. Eh? Yeah, sure does. Uh, that you know, and they, hey, that would be an interesting uh, lockup if ever we could uh, facilitate the idea of Mitch Danger Zone Clark and Filthy Tom Lawler, uh, two former MMA fighters like that taking place. Especially if we could uh, book that in the old Prairie Pro Wrestling ring. Oh, it'd be a dream come true. Let's work on it. Man. Well, you sure do. It's not like we don't have the time to work on it at the moment uh, until we can get back to those live shows like we've been craving. So, anyway, anything else to add to that uh, whole uh, episode there, Pop Smokes? No, I think it was just a strong episode overall. It didn't go uh, wild with having a whole bunch of matches. It had uh, it had an itinerary of things to do, uh, put some new people over pump the uh, the big show, the Kings of Coliseum, and uh, finish that Opera Cup with a fantastic final match, satisfying the fans. I think this episode had a bit of everything. Sure did, and what a great uh, ending to it, a great matchup. Opera Cup, fantastic this year. So thank you, MLW, for putting that on, carrying on that tradition, and giving us some excellent wrestling to top off 2020. So thank you very much. And we want to thank all of you for tuning in every time to Ring Respect Radio. Uh, we appreciate all the love and support and everybody who has subscribed already. And if you haven't, hey, go ahead, do us a favor, click that subscribe button down below and turn on the notification bell as well. We're always pumping out new material right here on Ring Respect Radio on the Video Bros Network. So please check it out and also go check out our friends over at Backbreaker Media who have past episodes of Ring Respect Radio up on both Podbean and YouTube as well. So check them out and give them a like, a subscribe, and a shout out from your good old video bros. Until the next time we hear from you, have a great day.